Okay, so this is um, an informational webinar on blended diet and digestive health. Now, um, doctors will go to school for many years studying digestive health. And, um, you know, dietitians will spend four years in university studying just digestion and how it affects us. So it's really difficult to put all of digestive health information um, into a one hour webinar. So I've tried to highlight some key points and I'm trying to make it, um, I'm trying to grab as much information as we need pertaining to a blended diet. So there are um, a few things within the webinar that specifically point to blended diets. Um, however, if there are things that you have questions about and this webinar did not cover it, uh, please email me, uh, veronica at blenderizedrn.com, and I'll try to go over any issues you have. Um, and if I can't find the answers for you, I can definitely point you in the right direction. So um, contact me with any issues or join our Facebook group, um, Blenderized RN. Okay, let's get started. So an overview, um, we'll just do a digestion overview, um, the differences between a blended diet and typical eating, which is not very much. Um, and specifically, I'm going to talk about digestive enzymes and um, what happens when we um, miss out on chewing our food and swallowing it. Uh, nutrient absorptions, absorption and deficiencies probiotics, constipation, uh, gut health, and uh, brain health are actually very much tied together. And I'll just briefly go over that. And actually gut health and brain health, I could do you know a five hour webinar on. There's so much information. And I encourage you to do some research on your own um, regarding this topic. Um, corn syrup, and that's another uh, topic that's um, really tied to gut health and um, formula versus food. And I'm gonna go over that briefly. I've covered formula in uh, many of my other webinars, so I'm not going to give it a lot of time, but we'll start off with digestion. So what is digestion? It's the mechanical and chemical breakdown of food into smaller components that are more readily absorbed into the bloodstream. And the digestive tract, well, where does it start? It starts at the mouth. Um, your a typical way of um, getting nutrients is by chewing your food and swallowing it and having it go down the esophagus. And you can see there's three glands within our mouth that help that start off digestion um, besides manually just chewing the food. Then the food travels down the esophagus into the stomach. So many people um, and this is including children and adults that eat through a G-tube, their digestion starts in the stomach. And as you can see, we've basically just bypassed the chewing in the esophagus. So um, I would say 95 to 99% of digestion is starting to happen in the stomach. And people who eat their food through a G-tube really are not compromised that much um, as far as digestion. Um, so the food enters the stomach and um, goes down um, into the small intestine and you can see the liver, gallbladder, and pancreas all um, give, um, dump their bile into the common bile duct that goes into the small intestine. And so there's a small intestine that leads to the large intestine and then um, the rectum. And I wanted to point out um, that the small intestine is really important because it's broken down into three sections. And those three sections do three different things. And so that I just want you to know where the absorption is happening um, within the body. Let's see, there's no questions yet, okay. So what does the stomach do? The food enters the stomach through the G-tube. The lower part of the stomach mixes up the food um, with digestive juices, and the mixture is referred to as chyme. Then the stomach empties its contents slowly into the small intestine. Um, generally, this takes about four hours. If you're 
you know, something like a steak takes a little longer to digest than a salad. So on average, it's about four hours. The duodenum or duodenum, um, the chyme will first enter into the duodenum where it is exposed to secretions that aid digestion. So these secretions include bile, salts, enzymes, and bicarb. Uh, the bile starts from the liver, help digest fats and fat soluble vitamins. So vitamin A, D, E, and K are absorbed in the early part of the small intestine. Um, and pancreatic enzymes help digest carbohydrates and fats. So bicarbonate from the pancreas neutralizes the acid from the stomach. The duodenum, um, the chyme is then further transitioned down into the second or middle part of the small intestine. Ma uh, mainly in the first half of the, of the duodenum, the majority of nutrients is absorbed here. So 90% of digestion happens, um, of, of nutrient absorption happens in the J par portion of the small intestine. So this involves proteins, carbohydrates, vitamins, and minerals. The ileum is the last section of the, of the small intestine and mainly absorbs water, uh, bile salts, and vitamin B12. Your large intestine, um, the primary function um, is to absorb fluids and electrolytes um, and a little bit of sodium and potassium, even though that's mainly absorbed in the small intestine. And it converts the remaining contents into more solid stool. Um, so the majority of the fluids, um, fluids that you're in taking in are absorbed through the large intestine. And we can see where um, something like dehydration, someone who's not taking in enough fluids, constipation is an issue because then, you know, the it your large intestine is taking as much as it can from the small amount that it's receiving, and then it leaves these dry uh, poops in the large intestine. So, um, it, it, for an adult, it it absorbs average of one to one point five liters of fluid each day, and it can and it can um, absorb. Up, up to five liters a day if needed. And so another function of the colon is to break down uh, or ferment dietary fiber to produce short chain fatty acids. Um, yes, so uh, an absorption summary. Uh, the duodenum in the small intestine absorbs vitamin A, D, E, and K, carbohydrates and fats. Uh, the duodenum proteins, carbohydrates, vitamins, and minerals, the ileum, water, bile salts, and vitamin D B12, and the large intestine is mainly fluids and electrolytes, um, particularly sodium and potassium, and it breaks down, break downs dietary fibers to produce short-chain fatty acids. So once we know that, if we find deficiencies within our diet, like let's say a vitamin B12 deficiency, we know that there is something going on mainly either in the ileum or we're not, um, you know, or we're not eating enough vitamin B12. So it, it kind of helps to know where the absorption is taking place. So common deficiencies. So deficiencies, I could do a four hour um, webinar again on deficiencies. So we're just gonna go over a few of them. If, um, if you'd like, it's something good for you to research um, common deficiencies. It's kind of eye-opening uh, how deficient we are becoming in our food, mainly, or, sorry, in our in our um, in our nutrients, mainly because our food is becoming less nutritious, and you know we're just not eating well anymore. Vitamin D. About fifty percent of the population is deficient in vitamin D, and actually, um, I'll talk about that. So, signs you may be having a vitamin D deficiency include being over the age of 50, having darker skin, obesity, um, achy bones, feeling blue, head sweating, and basically a poor immune function. And the vitamin D standards have changed recently. Um, they're about four times more than um, the old standards. So um, I know my doctor, um, has asked me to take 5,000 IU a day, whereas before the recommended amount was about 800. Um, so four or five times the old recommendations. My son is two and a half and he receives 2,500 IU a day. 
Um, and in the old standards, I believe he'd be receiving four or six hundred. So um, this is another good thing for people to look into. Um, and again, if you need more vitamin D, there are great vitamin D supplements, but nothing beats getting out into the sunshine uh, for about 10 minutes. Omega-3 fats. Um, so there's a lot of low concentrations of omega-3 fats um, and it increased risk. There's an increased risk from all causes. Um, and it's the sixth biggest killer of Americans. So an ideal ratio of omega-3s to omega-6 is about one to one. Um, omega-6 is, is found in like fried foods, you know, and but the typical Western diet is about one to 20 or one to 50. Um, so in addition to upping your omega-3 intake, you also need to reduce the amount of omega-6 in your diet, which means cutting down on processed and fried foods. Uh, sardines are one of the most concentrated sources of omega-3 fats. Um, so one serving will contain more than 50% of your recommended daily um, intake. Um, and they also contain um, nutrients that were mainly deficient in like vitamin B12, calcium, and chlorine. But um, Dr. Maricola, who is one of my favorite uh, medical doctors talking about nutrition, he recommends krill oil if you're going to be taking um, um, an omega-3 supplement rather than um, fish oil. So something to look into. Um, so if you if you have an omega-3 deficiency, um, you will have some dry flaky skin, alligator skin, or chicken skin on the back of the arms, um, dandruff or dry hair, soft brittle nails, fatigue, menstrual cramps, and poor attention span. Magnesium is the fourth most abundant mineral in your body, yet an estimated 80% of Americans are deficient in it. Um, best ways to get magnesium is a variety of vegetables, leafy green vegetables. Um, most people can keep their magnesium levels in therapeutic range without resorting to supplements. So plenty of dark green leafy vegetables, seaweed, um, spinach, Swiss chard, and beans, nuts, and seeds. So an avocado also contains magnesium. And Dr. Maricola suggests juicing your vegetables um, that will help enrich your diet with magnesium. Um, vitamin B12, also known as the energy vitamin. Two ways you can, you can become deficient through vitamin B12 in your diet is through inability to absorb it or because you're not getting it um, in the foods that you eat. So about one in four American adults are deficient in vitamin B12 and they get a lot of mental fog, memory problems, mood swings, fatigue, muscle weakness, and tingling in, in the extremities. Um, yeah, so by the time you notice B12 deficiency, it's usually been um, happening for a while. So um, you can, you can uh, improve your diet by including uh, foods like beef and beef liver. Grass-fed is highly preferable to grain-fed variety. Lamb, snapper, uh, salmon, shrimp, scallops. Um, organic pasteurized poultry and eggs. Okay, and you can you can supplement. I would talk to your doctor if you want to talk about a um, a B12 supplement. Iodine. I always tell people um, when making a blend for your child um, once a day, um, put in some salt with iodine. It's an important nutrient found in every organ and tissue, and many people are, are deficient in this nutrient. Um, worldwide, up to 40% of the population is at risk for iodine deficiency. Um, iron is another one. Iron is essential for human life. Um, it is a key part of various proteins and enzymes. Um, yeah, it, it basically builds hemoglobin in your body. So, um, it is a very important one. If you have too little iron, you might experience fatigue, decreased uh, immunity, um, or iron deficiency anemia, which can be serious if left untreated. Um, yeah, so it's very common in children and premenopausal women, and absorption is a big um, issue with iron. Um, yeah, so I would talk to your doctor about um, any sort of iron deficiencies. 
Um, there is a test um, for iron. It's called the ferritin test, um, and it's important to. It's a preventative health screen. Um, the ferritin uh, levels usually lie between 20 and 80, and um, although you're not testing the iron directly, it it is a test to show how much iron is in your blood. So below 20 is an indicator that you are iron deficient and above 80 suggests you have an iron surplus. Um, so yeah, ask your doctor about that. Again, iron is another one of those things I could do a one hour long seminar about. Um, so digestive enzymes. There are a lot of digestive enzymes. Enzymes are composed of amino acids and are secreted by your body to help digestion. More than 3,000 different enzymes have been identified, and some experts believe there may be another 50,000 we have yet to discover. And each enzyme has a different function in our body. So enzymes drive biological processes necessary for your body to build, circulate nutrients, eliminate unwanted chemicals, and any biochemical processes that go without you even thinking about it. Um, so how do I fit digestive enzymes into a one hour webinar on GI, or uh, sorry, uh, on gastric um, G tubes, on people who eat through a G tube. Well, you know, let's talk about uh, what are we missing with a blended diet. So, when, when eating through a G tube, we bypass the mouth and the esophagus. Saliva contains the en enzyme amylase, which starts the digestion of starch um, in the food to maltose. Uh, the pancreas also makes amylase. So should we worry? Not all starch is digested to maltose in the mouth. Some are digested in the stomach and some in the duodenum. So if you're having trouble with starch digestion, talk to your doctor about possibly adding amylase to your blends. Um, and you can buy it over the counter. So um, that is something to consider. Uh, if you have a child on a ketogenic diet or a seizure control diet like my son is, it's not an issue because he doesn't have any starch in his diet. If you're on a low carb diet, it's probably not an issue. Um, but if you are including potatoes and um, starchy items like that, it might be something to think about, um, especially if you're a child or you're um, experiencing a lot of bloating and discomfort, that might be one of the issues. So again, what are we missing with the blended diet? In addition, um, an additional enzyme, um, lipase, is made by um, your saliva glands. Um, and this helps um, with long chain triglycerides. Um, it helps break them down into partial uh, glycerides and free fatty acids, which is important in digestion. Um, so it this is important for fat absorption by the small intestine. And long chain triglycerides can't be absorbed. And as much as 30% of fat um, is is um, broken down by lipase. So um, the stomach also produces lipase, and it's called gastric lipase um, instead of lingual lipase. So should we worry? Are we missing the lipase that our that our saliva glands makes? So there was a um, a study done on lingual and gastric lipase, um, basically comparing different species, you know, who is using more um, of what type of lipase. Um, and they found that in, in humans, gastric lipase was the predominant enzyme in the stomach during digestion, whereas lingual lipase activity was present in only trace amounts. So that being said, our stomach makes enough lipase that we don't have to be too concerned with the lipase that um, we may be missing out on that our saliva glands could be making. Okay, so um, constipation is a big issue. And there are many reasons for constipation. And I, and I briefly go over constipation in almost every webinar because um, a lot of people that are fed through a G-tube, children and adults, um, also have other health issues. So constipation, dehydration is a big cause of constipation. Like we saw, if your large intestine is not getting enough water, it will absorb it all as much as it can from the, the stool that's forming. Um, a poor diet is um, a very good way to become constipated. 
Low tone. My son is very low tone and he struggles with constipation, as do many children that are low tone. And also, um, he is on um, not as much medication as he used to be on, and, but medications tend to, um, a lot of medications cause constipation. So we may be doing everything right as far as diet and fluids, but the medications may still be the barrier. Inactivity, it's another problem with low tone um, children and adults is that they tend to be inactive. And so the inactivity again causes uh, constipation. Um, dairy products. Uh, my pediatrician, my son's pediatrician, removed all the dairy products from his diet, and it has helped a bit, but um, it, with some children, it does cause a lot of uh, constipation. <clears throat> so foods high in, ha in fat or sugar can constipate also, and I know this was a question, you know, do high fat foods constipate? They can, <clears throat> they can also cause the opposite effect depending on the type of fat. Constipation, again, I always say this, it can lead to reflux and vomiting. Um, so it's really important that um, you keep the flow going. You, um, I recommend daily poops and um, at the most every other day. And I always recommend a constipation massage. I do it for my son every day. Um, you're going to be working clockwise um, from the lower right hand um, side of the abdominal abdo abdomen and work your way around that belly button all the way down and you're following the large intestine if you have any questions um, about constipation or you need help um, with your child's constipation you can email me veronica at blenderizedrn.com so foods that help you poop rhubarb most people are not aware that if you eat a bunch of rhubarb, it makes you go to the bathroom. Um, the senna uh, compounds found in rhubarb can act as a natural laxative. Aloe, like rhubarb, aloe contains gut flushing senna. Um, add aloe to um, any blend and it'll really help with, um, with some constipation. So artichokes, they contain a lot of fiber, um, any sort of any sort of legumes will will help. Um, yeah, beans, um, peaches. Um, there are tropical fruit now. Peaches contain sugars that are not well absorbed, and so it'll help move waste through your system. Nuts contain a lot of fiber. Grapes also, and apples and coffee. Be careful with coffee. Coffee can stimulate the bowels, but it can also dehydrate. And if you're already constipated, it may not help, and it may just constipate you more. So coffee is okay for an older child. I would talk to a pediatrician um, about it. And, and culturally, coffee is accepted different. Um, in some cultures, very young children drink tea and coffee um, and are okay. You know, it's a cultural norm, normal thing, but um, it may be frowned upon by your pediatrician. So just, uh, I would talk to your doctor before giving your child coffee. Okay, so gut health versus brain health. Um, these two things are very closely tied together, and I actually would like to do a webinar just on this topic um, as I do more research into it. There is so much information about this. So leaky gut is the protective, um, the protective layer, the, the closest layer, the inner layer of the intestine um, becomes compromised, usually through swelling or other reasons. Um, and it's a response to a variety of factors. So bacteria, some medication, stress, environmental toxins, uh, elevated blood sugars can do this. Um, and then gut irritating foods like uh, gluten and high fructose corn syrup. So once this intestinal barrier is compromised, undigested food particles leak into the blood, bloodstream where they, they create an immune response. And this can create system-wide inflammation and this also can um, do damage to the brain. Um, 
Yeah, and so loss of gut integrity can lead to a leaky brain. So how to improve a leaky gut? And again, sorry, just to go back to the leaky brain, if you are at all interested in improving, you know, how you're feeling and your um, mental abilities, uh, being able to focus and feel awake and have energy, please do some research into leaky gut and leaky brain. Um, there are a lot of neurologists that have written books about this and it's a huge topic. So how to improve a leaky gut? Um, eat foods rich in probiotics. Um, eat lower carb, low sugar foods. Um, embrace high quality fats. Um, the high quality fats are like coconut oil, avocados. Make sure your fats are unrefined. Do not do not eat unre don't eat refined fats. So make sure they're all natural and cold pressed. Eat foods rich in prebiotics. So probiotics, we all know, are um, the good bacteria that live in our gut. But prebiotics feed the probiotics. So things like onions and garlic um, are great prebiotics. Drink filtered water um, and eliminate high fructose corn syrup from your diet. Um, and I had a question about this in my Blenderized RN group about soaking or cooking your oats. You should soak or cook your oats. So don't eat raw oats. And I wanted to go over this because I was specifically asked about this. All grains contain an acid, phytic acid, an organic acid, which phosphorus is bound to. Um, and it's all in the outer layer um, of the grain or bran. So if the phytic acid, phytic acid um, is left alone and untreated, um, it can combine with calcium, magnesium, copper, iron, and especially zinc in the intestinal tract and block their absorption. So this is why a diet in unfermented whole grains may lead to serious mineral deficiencies and bone loss. So if you're not cooking or soaking your grains, you can become mineral um, deficient. Uh, probiotics. So the probiotics are live bacteria and yeast that are good for your health, especially your digestive system. We usually think of bacteria as something that causes disease, but your body is full of bacteria, both good and bad. And actually, actually, um, I don't have the study on me now, but there is a study that shows for every one cell that is made up of you, your own cell, we have 10 bacteria cells in our body. So we are mainly a bacteria entity so we really rely on them and probiotics are often called good or helpful bacteria because they help keep your digestive system healthy so lactobacillus bacillus uh, this may be the most common probiotic you'll find it in yogurt fermented foods um, different strains can help with diarrhea and may help people who can't digest lactose or sugar in milk so a lot of people who cannot uh, handle milk or milk products are okay with yogurt because the bacteria help break down those large proteins in the in the in the milk product and the bifidobacterium you can also find it in some dairy products it may also help ease the system the symptoms of irritable bowel syndromes and other conditions so those are a couple of them okay so corn syrup why I talk about corn syrup all the time, because people who uh, have a G-tube or a GJ are always encouraged, I would say 99% of my clients, 99% of the people I see are always encouraged to go on commercial formula because you eat food by the mouth, this is what they say, and then you are um, you just need the right formula for the G-tube, and that is incorrect. You actually should be taking in food through the G-tube, even the J, GJ. Um, and corn syrup is the main ingredient in every single commercial formula out there. And it is the, one of the worst things you can ingest. So the newest research, research shows that high fructose corn syrup is not only addictive, but it can cause behavioral reactions similar to those produced by drugs such as cocaine. The results of these studies were presented by addiction expert um, he's the Associate Professor of Neuroscience and Applied Cognitive Science um, in Ontario, Canada, University of Guelph. 
Um, so high fructose corn syrup and cane sugar are not biochemically identical or processed the same way by the body despite what you may have been told. High fructose corn syrup is an industrial food product and far from natural or naturally occurring substance. So again, uh, high fructose corn syrup or corn syrup, it causes um, leaky gut, which can lead to leaky brain. So formula, while we're on the topic, almost all formulas, if not all, I have not found one that doesn't derive its carbohydrates from corn syrup, uses high fructose corn syrup as their source of carbohydrates. Here is the ingredients in um, Pediasure 1.0. So water, corn malodextrin, which is high fructose corn syrup in a dry form. Milk protein concentrate, sugar, um, sassaflower oil, soy oil, and medium chain triglycerides. So it's oil, a milk protein, and high fructose corn syrup. And then all the other vitamins that you are told that um, the formula is complete with, it's got less than 0.5% of the total ingredients are vitamins and they're powdered vitamins. They're not, who knows if you're absorbing them properly because um, it's not coming from real food. And then my version of uh, Pediasure 1.0 is um, with the exact same calories protein, fat, and carbohydrates. This is my version. So um, 22 grams of chicken drumstick, tablespoon of cooked lentils, 50 grams of avocado, handful of spinach, a peach, and 15 grams of honey. And that will give you the same calories, fats, and carbohydrates, and protein as Pediasure 1.0, and it'll give you a lot more nutrients. So, let me see if I have any questions. Um, I will definitely dive more into this, um, into this, these specific topics later on um, as I was just trying to go over everything briefly today. Um, if you have any questions, please email me, veronica at blenderizedrn.com. Um, and, or you can join my Facebook group, um, just find Blenderized RN, um, the group is different than my page. I also have a page on Facebook. So if you have any, any questions, please email me. Um, otherwise I am going to stop the webinar and we will see you again next month for our next webinar.